Hello and welcome to MLB Talk Play Ball. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. This is our second episode of for I-80 Sports Baseball. Uh, so in this, we are continuing free agent signings. Uh, there was some, there was some, oh, and trade. There was a trade. We have a trade. Do, there was do, a trade. Do, 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 do. There was no one drafted. Do, yeah. Do, 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 do. I think that's like in, <laughs> in June. It's an MLB draft. Yeah. Oh man, I cannot wait to do that show. You guys, you guys want to see something incredibly dull turn into something incredibly interesting? Watch Kilroy and Mongo take on the MLB draft. <laughs> coming, uh, coming at you. I ain't doing it. Oh, uh, that's a great one. How? How am I gonna? Why? Why would I do that? Well, I mean, it, it, I I mean, mean we may we can recap it. No, define. I, I don't want to sit through. I want to take round four. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, we'll only cover <laughs> round four. Ah. Okay. I like that. <laughs> we won't. We won't record it. We're just only going to when we do our uh, our tr- coverage of the draft recap. Mm-hmm. It will only be about round four. Okay, I'm in. Okay, that's the best round. That's where that's where legends that's where legends get made. Uh, and a and, whole lot of relief pitchers get drafted, but but mostly legends. Yep, the legend of the I don't know. Baseball nah, I, I can't honestly tell you who a fourth rounder was, but uh, but I can tell you it's it's. You know what? I'm curious. It's a very long process, um, and you usually don't see those prospects amount to much for two to five years, um, but they're trying their best to make it more fun. They do the thing now where the prospects get called out of a fake dugout uh, to come on stage. I kind of enjoy that. Um, but there we go. Anyway, as as Corey is looking that up, like he said, uh, we will be covering. Five trades or free agents, five or six uh, each week. Oh, Ricky Henderson. Oh, Ricky Henderson. Ozzie Smith, Jeff Bagwell, Yadier Molina, and Paul O'Neill. Oh. Those are really good. Let's go. Fourth (laughs) round. I knew what I was talking about. (laughs) And then you got Cody Bellinger, Cliff Lee, Garrett Anderson, Corey Kluber, and Luis Gonzalez, which is also a pretty good group. All right. Fourth round. David Justice. Ron Grant, uh, Gant. Oh, the legend that is Ron Gant. All right. Jonathan Papelbon, Greg Nettles, and Brandon Crawford. Another solid group. Wow. And Bo Jackson. Oh, well, naturally. <laughs> the, man, the man got drafted to every sport multiple times at some point. He was bound to be a fourth rounder somewhere. Rich Hill. So we got Mike Clevenger is up there. Yeah. Desi Relifer. Eric Burns is up there. Shout out Eric Burns. Um, wow. Okay. So, David DeJesus. Can't so, forget him. He was... Uh, a person who I remember for some reason. With all this being said, though, as much fun as the draft can be, free agency is really, really where it's at more often than not in the MLB. Yeah, I mean, so let's real quick before we jump into that, sure. let's talk. I, I, w- I would like to hear your opinion okay. about the MLB draft. Like, it's tough, right? Mm-hmm. Like, of all the sports, it's the toughest in my it to like pick up a player that's going to make an impact, right? Yeah, it's it's ridiculous because you have so many players that you whiff on to mm-hmm. begin with, and then also with the way that the the money works in the MLB draft. And again, we'll go into this more in June. But sometimes you're not even taking the best player; you're intentionally leaving the best player on the board for financial reasons. So it's so hard to lock in a good draft pick to begin with. And even if you do, congratulations, one ninth of your batting order has been set. Like. You can have one really, really good player, and it could still mean nothing. See Mike Trout's last eight years, you know. So you finally land a gem somewhere. You need to be able to – if you're going to do it solely through the draft, you really need to either have an amazing draft class or you need to be able to churn out a successful first round year after year after year, which it just doesn't happen because of the unpredictability of of prospects. Yeah, I mean, and and the the minor league system does a pretty good job of vetting players – in my opinion, like really like you don't really see many failed minor leaguers who like make an impact in the MLB. 
Yeah, and the, the problem is we we tend to focus on the failures, especially those of us who are in dynasty baseball leagues or things of that nature. And so we don't – if you actually like took a pen and pencil and went – okay, that person actually kind of developed, that person took a step back, that person developed. It's actually overwhelming. It's more like 70% of the guys who are on the prospect list, you know, MLB or, you know, 100 or whoever, stay there. But we look at this one guy who was like, oh, he's number seven. Now he's not on the list anymore. MLB prospect guys don't know what they're talking about. They, they missed one. See, I, like, well, also, I also don't – that's also like – I don't know. It's like with scouting too, right? Like yeah. in any other sport, like, like you know – all these top quarterback prospects that come out and they're like highly touted and then they, they fail in the NFL. And it's like, well, it's about what system you get drafted to. Right. It's about the coach Mm -hmm. or coaching staff, not just, again, this is all sports and and this is what leads to busts and stuff like that. And, and also your ability to stay healthy, right? Which is very key and something people forget about or, or ignore or, hold against someone which is ridiculous like people will call greg odin one of the biggest busts in nba history because uh because he he couldn't live up to being the first overall pick but the guy was just never able to stay healthy when right. he early in his career before he the injuries he looked really good mm-hmm. baseball is the same thing with with tons of players yeah like that yeah especially pitchers nowadays i mean they're just they're not used to going that long no. of a season and then you know a, a tommy john or two later and you know guys get forgotten about it, it happens yep. all the time so on to not forgotten people. Ah, nice segue. We're going to start with, uh, you know, wh- wh- where would you like to start? Do you want to start? I like right where you are on that screen. Do you like where I am? Yes. All right. So we have here Carlos Correa signed with the San Francisco Giants on a 13-year, $350 million contract. He was, I believe, maybe I'm... I believe yeah, yeah, he was the top shortstop available on the market at that point. At that point, yes. Uh, you could, yeah. Let's say it. Let's say that. Um. So let's see. I have, I, sorry. I well, while, while you're looking at it, I'm, I'm going like this. Because no, no, that I'm not looking at. I'm it's looking debatable on on when Dansby Swanson and him, for that matter, were truly off the market. They kind of. You know, they're ass- both the same age. Assume, assuming you don't call Carlos Correa and go, you want in, and he goes, yes. Assuming these negotiations take a couple of days, it's debatable if, if Dansby Swanson was really available at that moment. Um, and so it's also debatable on which one you like. But the, the point is the big, big guns, you know, the the Trey Turners of the world, the Xander Bogarts of the world, they were off the board. So by that point, we were into the 1B tier, the Carlos Correa is the Dansby Swanson of the world. So uh, Carlos Correa's contract turns, it, it seems to be about, I, I'm, I'm, I'm rounding up here, Please is about $27 million per year on 13 years. Okay. Uh, which is, all, uh, you know, it's, it's money. It's, a, it's an amount of money. Uh, not totally surprised the Giants you know, went after him. The Giants were really trying hard to get uh, Aaron Judge. Mm-hmm. They failed. They 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 failed out on that. So they needed to make up somewhere. Right. And not that Carlos Correa is a replacement for him because he's. They're not. They're not the same. No, they don't play the, the same, same position. Player. They're, they're different players. Right, of course. But um, I can see why they went for him. He's only twenty eight years old. Still relatively young. Thirteen years for a twenty eight year old is not. I mean, it's not great. He's so, going to be 41 when this thing is over. Yeah. I don't know. I don't understand <laughs> these con- These contracts are so weird nowadays. Baseball contracts going 13 years seems odd. We do seem to be going into a new world of contracts for sure. Also, I'm surprised any player would sign a 13-year contract because a lot of people just think of it as, as such an unlucky number. That's, that's fair, although Correa has never been one to – think anything's luck at least from you know what you hear from in the media right right no 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 i know but now, now to what you just said though it's very or important to the teams too right well like right right i mean but to what you just said is is very important um 13 years from now i mean think about what money would now God. granted we've we've had some financial woes but think about what this contract would have looked like in 2009 it would have been insane Mm-hmm. 13 years from now it's a bargain this, right right this will this will potentially be a great deal these these guys might be getting paid with crypto in 13 years and this contract won't even look this won't even exist um so i i think that's where san francisco is going with this i know uh christopher russo called this one of the worst contracts of all time um i wouldn't necessarily go that far um because again i think 
financially that's what they're trying to do here. But at the end of the day, I do agree with Russo in the sense that is this going to really tip the scales in any way? No. Are they going to in any way sniff the Dodgers or Padres for a while? No. And honestly, the Diamondbacks, if you look at their farm system, they have an elite outfield building there. They have some other good young players there. Even Colorado has Tovar, has Zach Veen coming up. They're going to start chasing San Francisco. San Francisco might be paying this dude a ton of money for a very long time just to be a perennial also ran. Um, so I'm not really sure where San Francisco is going with this, other than, like you said, they had to do something. They, they couldn't be the, they didn't want to go into the season as the team that lost out on Judge in the way that they lost out on him, remember, with all the, the false reports and everything. I really so thought that they had him. I thought they did too, but now at least they're the team that netted Correa. They're not the right. team that lost Judge, and that, for what it's worth, is a much better outlook going into the season. Now, you also have to question, for this contract to be this bonkers, because when Trey Turner, you know, when no one got 12, right? 11 was the biggest number this offseason. Mm -hmm. And so for them to go all the way up to 13, you got to wonder, there had to be some mystery bidder here, right? Somebody had to be bidding with them. And I'm I'm going to assume it's the Twins because immediately, A, he was there last year, but B, immediately after this, the Twins then seemingly spite added Joey Gallo for an eight-figure number. I don't know if you saw that. We won't, we won't break that one down. But usually the team that says, screw it, we're going to take Joey Gallo, is usually the team that's pretty infuriated. They just missed out on something. So I think we'll eventually hear stories that this number might be – because at first glance it just seemed like the Giants just played Monopoly, right? They were just like, here's a fake amount of very large money. Come be our friend. When we were like, where did this number come from? I think we're going to eventually learn the market was a little bit more – tighter than we're giving the, the Giants credit for. Oh, yeah, no, no, I'm not I'm not saying that. I wow, 13 years is just so long. Oh, it's very I, I don't like so I, I, I to me I don't like seven years is a long year a yeah. long contract. No, for, like first off, him, why would you want to do 13 years? You're now locked in, mm -hmm. right? That means you can't when you're 41, when he's done with this contract, his his career is over. Right. Right or pretty Pres much over. Presum if, I mean, if he bets on himself correctly, or presumably though he retires at forty-one and at forty-two, he's the Giants' hitting coach. Like he's now a he's a San Francisco right. guy. But for my life my now. point is like he's twenty-eight. He's still relatively young. If he took a five-year deal, he could have gotten another big contract. Or do what a lot of these guys are doing, like Machado did, like Cole did, who we're going to talk about a little later on. Oh, with drop, the opt drop a player option yeah. in there. It, it's it's weird that this is thirteen set in stone years, and with with trade, you know with trade exemptions, everything else. He's there. I mean, he is a San Francisco giant mm -hmm. until we are, you know, well into our forties. It's crazy to think about, but, uh, hey, you know what? He's, he's out more power player. to him, I guess, or the giants. I don't know who, who won that of the two, the giants are him. I think the giants, because I really do think this amount of money won't be this grand, uh, you know, in whatever that'll be 2035. Um, but if I mean conversely, if something goes wrong in the economy, this dude might have <laughs> this dude might be a genius. Not too. But this, uh, this but I, will I, I, probably I, end up being. I don't know what can he do to live up to this, I, right? Like I, <laughs> I don't think, and, and it's not that, like he could put up like all he could put up all star numbers for the first five years, just numbers. Not I mean, it's hard to get an all star game, but like right, right. It doesn't matter if he doesn't end up with a ring for them, right? Correct. Sorry. Sorry. If you happen to be listening and not looking at the screen, I'm tapping my ring finger right now. Um, yeah, no, he he now needs to win a ring for them. And they do not particularly have a great farm system by any means. This is going to financially handicap them for a while. So I, I don't really know what they're – I mean, unless the idea is their farm system is so bad by having them for 13 years, they now have time to develop a farm. Like, you could sign an 18-year-old today – he can be ready to play when he's 23 and he'll still be able to play with Carlos Correa for eight years. That's Do you realize true. how absurd that is? That is, that like, is so, so maybe their plan is to just kind of let him be for these first handful of years. And if I'm a Giants fan, if you're out there listening, I'm telling you right now, be super patient. They are they are betting, they are not seeing this as a 13-year playoff run. They if they're smart about this, they have to be thinking this is a very slow burn to when he's 33, 34 him being the you know the savvy veteran of a team that has now fully developed but there's not a whole lot they can do you know with this you know with this team as currently constructed especially when you look at some of the guys they lost in the offseason yeah all right on to the next signing uh let's go with Dansby all right because that makes the most logical sense so this is a pretty well, I don't know the the numbers yet I'm about to do it now but it is a pretty reasonable, seemingly comparatively, contract. Uh, 
it's a seven year, $177 million contract, which is about 25 million per year. So about 2 million less per year. Uh, on a, uh, Again, this is just, you know, rounding down in this case versus rounding up for him. And nearly half the amount of money. I mean, half the amount of years. I right. Mean, I mean, that's, that's yeah. what you're getting here. Um, also 28 years old. So this this is sits in with what I was saying where you get, you, if you're, he still will be relatively young enough that he might be able to get another contract. Maybe right. not a ridiculous contract, but a good enough contract, you know, hopefully, you know, to, to, to you know, put him into his twilight years. Right. Of, uh, so that's a contract I would, I mean, again, I'm, this is this is me, a person who will never even come close to signing any of these types of contracts. As we say on the basketball show, this is just the opinion of two dudes in a dining room. Like, take it all with a grain of salt. But it sure seems like this is the more reasonable of two contracts. Now, uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I, we didn't. I didn't say who he signed with. He signed with the Cubs. Uh, okay, that's very. Uh, that's actually very, very important for this conversation. So I, I think this is a good deal for the Cubs. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good deal for Dansby. Mm -hmm. uh, I think. Both sides are, are happy with this. I think this is a good uh, move in the right direction for the uh, Chicago Cubs. Yeah, and um, I, so very important here to distinguish. Dansby Swanson is a bit of an Iron Man. He's only missed two games in the last two seasons, played all 162 last year, led the league in at-bats during the shortened season. So he can fully bet on himself, believing he will still be a healthy full-time player at age 34, 35, whereas Correa, even though he's been healthy recently, has had some injuries through the past, had to take a one-year contract, partly because he needed to prove that he could stay healthy for a season. So Correa, it makes more sense to lock himself in. All right. Whereas with Swanson, he can bet on himself still being up for another you know, nice size contract when he's 34. So that's super important. And with that being said, also, the Cubs have this natural grittiness to them. Um, you know, as a franchise, we fell in love with that team about six, seven years ago that had Rizzo, that had Bryant, that had love these that very team. blue collar. Right, you didn't have to be a Cubs fan. You still loved it. And they were a very blue collar feel to them. And Dansby Swanson really, you know, brings that enthusiasm. He brings that everyday workman likeness that really will fit in with the Cubs. Um, you know, 25 homers, 18 stolen bases last year. They're changing the rules to make stolen bases easier. So they've probably dropped a 20, 25, 25, 25 kind of guy right there in the heart of their lineup for, you know, better part of seven years. And and, and I love this deal so for them. That That's news to me because I, I, I'm, I'm terrible at keeping up with news and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And they, they changed some stuff to help make it easier for stealing bases. Yeah, we're going to cover this in a show as we get closer to the season. But they're making the bases bigger, which will make it easier to – A, it'll make it right. closer physically, but also it'll make it easier to, you know, sneak in over the, the gloved hand. Um, but second of all, they're making it that um, if you – you can only get two attempts at a pickoff, on the third one, if you don't pick the guy off, it's a free base. So oh, it means after two, interesting. pretty much after two I bases, mean, you're going to see some really exuberant I, I, I definitely noticed that there was a big downtick in stolen bases in, in the past, right. I don't know, five, ten years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm glad that they're doing something to address it because base running and stolen bases and stuff like that is, to me, a very important part of baseball. That seems to have kind of been forgotten. Yeah, and a fun part of the game too. Yeah, right? they're oh, trying to, all they're trying to do is make it more exciting for for younger oh, fans, yeah, yeah. and it definitely does. It's a great stolen bases are one of the funnest plays in baseball. Yeah, it was so much fun. And I mean, thinking back about the um, the night the, the the 90s, early 2000s Yankees, that was a very big part of, of the, their. Yeah, I mean, for for everybody, I mean, the stolen base has just gone completely away. I mean, I, I mean, Rick, Rick, you say the name Ricky Henderson, we all know why. You know, there were guys who literally were stolen base guys. Who are the stolen base guys now? I'll let you. I'll let you <laughs> comment below, please. Tell me who I'm forgetting. But there really aren't stolen base guys anymore. That's not a thing that you can be known for. Hopefully, that'll come back. Especially there are a couple of young guys, that, you know, a couple of prospects who are just lightning fast. Who would have, you know, five years ago, six years ago, got completely lost. That you know, hopefully. Um, you know, can find their place in this league if the stolen base can make a return because it'll just add a whole new list of characters. I've, had, I, I've been waiting for this to come back. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that this does succeed. And it's something I miss from baseball. Yeah, for sure. I'm with you on that. All right. Uh, anything else you want to talk about, Mr. Dansby here? 
Now, the one thing I'll say is the only minor concern here is he definitely played better. Now, granted, you could just say he's maturing, he's getting older, but he definitely played better when the Braves got better, when they had, you know, when they had Matt Olson, when Austin Riley really came into his own, when Michael Harris got there. You know, Dansby Swanson was pretty much at his best last year when he was like the fifth, sixth option on this I mean, team. So you do have to wonder if by now being expected to carry the Cubs. I mean, they, they have Suzuki, they have a couple other good players there, but he's definitely going to be looked at as, as a as a primary source of offense instead of a guy who just continues moving. So will that pressure get to him? It seemed like early on when he was a first overall pick coming out of college, you know, school, um, you know, the pressure seemed to get to him a little bit early on. And then when he could come to the Braves and just be himself, he relaxed a little bit more. So if I'm the Cubs, maybe I'm already thinking, does this guy over the next seven years need a true one B to go with him? I'm already thinking, well, how can I move some prospects? Um, but I, I mean, that should I would be just something least, they're looking to do anyway. Right. But at, at, at first I would just see if, he can continue doing what he did, you know, because as constructed right now, this is now, you know, a, a pretty, in a very, in a fairly winnable NL Central, um, you know, this is a team that definitely, you know, they added Cody Bellinger as well. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about that in a later episode, but this is a team that definitely, definitely improved from where they were last year. Um, and, you know, as long as, you know, if Bellinger can read, you know, develop his former self, if Swanson is truly now, you know, bulletproof, regardless of where he's playing, who he's with, you know, that's, those are two guys who can really add to this team. All right, so let's move on to – let's do the trade. Sure. All right. Monger's going to take this one. With all due respect to the family of what I can only assume is Justin Yeager, maybe Justin Yeager, I'm not even sure, um, we're going to only focus on the key pieces here. Um, we had a three-team trade. It was the Braves, the Brewers, uh, and the Oakland A's got involved. The Braves ended up with Sean Murphy, catcher from the Oakland A's, uh, Milwaukee ended up with William Contreras, catcher from the Atlanta Braves, and Oakland ended up with, a, I think it was five names, but the main ones to take away here are Brewers outfielder Astori Ruiz and Braves minor league starting pitcher uh, Kyle Muller. Um, so that's really the the breakdown here. Um, shall we take a look at this team by team? Yeah. You're that excited, I see. Beautiful. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right, so let's start with the Braves. I ate a lot of sushi. Fair enough. Let's start with the Braves here. Um, For the Braves, this is, um, on paper at least, a pretty logical move. They get Sean Murphy, and that's a huge upgrade defensively Mm -hmm. at catcher. Um, You know, William Contreras is good with the bat last year, but this is a huge, huge defensive upgrade. And that's important when you look at the Braves pitching staff. Mike Soroka is supposed to be coming back from a very long time removed from injury. He missed all of last season. Um, you got to hope Ian Anderson, who almost won Rookie of the Year in 2020 and then was so bad last year he didn't finish the season with the Major League team. Um, If he's coming back up, these are young pitchers who need elite catching to help them out, and Sean Murphy can do that for them. So I think, you know, they're looking at their pitching staff and saying, we need not only what, you know, Sean Murphy's not a complete offensive waste. He batted 250 last year. He's got some pop. So if you're looking at, okay, we can still have a guy whose bat is not a complete waste, and in the meantime, he can be a huge boost for this pitching staff, it makes a ton of sense. But I also need to give a shout out to Brian, one of our hockey guys here at I-80, uh, who immediately pointed out it really didn't matter who this was. Mm-hmm. It could have been anybody. The real key here is Sean Murphy demonstrates to the rest of the league, hey, this is not a two-horse race in the NL East. This is a three-horse race. We are right there with the Phillies and Mets. We are still They, were the, they won going. the division. Right, right. And so, I mean, the Phillies obviously made that major Trey Turner ad. Uh, the Mets, you know, we talked about it last week. If you didn't watch last week's episode, it was the pilot episode. We had a blast. Please check it out if you want to see all the Met ads, but they did a ton um, like that. And so, you know, this is the Braves way of saying, hey, we're still in on this. And what that does is we're now in that part of the offseason where, you know, that veteran bench guy or that veteran left-handed reliever, they're making their decisions basically on which team do I want to bet on? Who can get me a ring? And so if the Braves are sending this message clearly basically to the rest of free agency, hey, listen, we're right there with them. Come join us. Um, You know, that's really the importance of this for them. Yeah, uh, I agree. I think that this was exactly what the Braves were looking for. Um, I think that this is exactly what the A's are looking for because the A's are still back to the rebuild as they always seem to be. Yeah, for the for the A's, this is a little bit of um, sort of deck chairs in a way because their major prospect coming up is Shea Langley as a catcher. So Sean Murphy here is really, I mean, he's a good player. He's a nice, nice guy, but not terribly needed in Oakland. In the meantime, they really don't have much by way of outfield depth. 
So Estore Ruiz comes in, um, huge stolen bases guy, um, 85 stolen bases across three leagues last year to go with 16 home runs. I really like his this, upside. This is who you were talking about. Yes, this, this is the guy who can go nuts under these mm-hmm. new stolen base rules if given every, you know everyday chances. And even if he's not an everyday player next year, just having a guy like that be a pinch runner oh, yes. on a team that has nothing to lose because Oakland's not supposed to be that good next year. Pinch runners just, is also something that's, that that seems to have died. Right. Why would you not let this guy, you know, your cleanup hitter hits a single in the eighth. Why would you not always put Estari Ruiz into pinch run and see if he can make something happen in a, like a in like a 3-2 game or something? Um, it's the best part of baseball to me. Yeah, absolutely. So he could, he could be a fantasy, a, a, a hidden fantasy gem next year, um, you know, just on stolen bases in that tiny Athletics, can you do us a favor and actually do this? And not, uh, yeah, know. please unleash a story, Reese. Please let that man steal every chance he's on base, just no matter how he gets all, there. Just all, send him. all next year because you're you're still you're still bad. <laughs> you are bad with all due respect. You're going to be bad a few more years. I love let what him you're, play. I love what you're doing. Just let but, him play. But for right now, let the young guys play, which along with that, Kyle Muller, also who would have been lost in Atlanta, is supposed to potentially be like a number five starting option for them. And so, credit to the A's here. Um, you know, last year they moved Frankie Montas for Ken Waldachuk. And so Montas is now maybe going to be the number five for the Yankees. He's going to compete with Domingo Herman. And, you know, he was a waste down the stretch and they really didn't need Sean Murphy either. So they got rid of pieces they didn't really need or the other team couldn't really use. And in, in the case of Montas and in return, they got conceivably their future number two and number five starting pitcher for the next, you know, 10 years, along with a guy who has a lot of freak athleticism out there in the outfield. Now, what do you think from the Brewers perspective, why they, they did this trade and do you agree with it for them mm. so far these other two this sounds like it was a match made in heaven for both of them yeah, but I, that just sounds like that, based off of how how this conversation has been going it doesn't sound like you're going to say anything good about this for the brewers if there is a loser in this trade it is the brewers and the reason why is because i happen to be high on Estor Ruiz. i just am if you are not you do not feel that way. And I totally respect that, you know, just a friendly agree to disagree. But here's the thing about the Brewers. Amongst their top six prospects are four outfielders. Weimer's there, Frelick's there, Churio's there. Um, Garrett Mitchell, who came up last year, is there. They're loaded with young outfielders. We know they're very high on Garrett Mitchell. Um, now, I personally don't like this move because Mitchell and Frelick are basically the same guy. I would have moved one of them. Um, but again, we don't know. Maybe the A said, I will only do it for Ruiz. Maybe the Brewers, you know, like those guys as guys, you know, just as human beings more. We have no idea. Um, so I think they sent the wrong outfielder out. But again, with five outfielders and no particular young catcher in the organization, it it made a, a ton of sense just, again, from kind of balancing out the team. Now, Contreras is only 25 years old. Um, he's going to plug in as the cleanup hitter this year. And this is a team destined for a rebuild in the near future. Um, you know, they called up Garrett Mitchell last year, Bryce Terang coming up this year. Keston Hero is still only 26, 27 years old. Um so it's going to be nice. He's basically going to be their cleanup hitter, you know, as they keep building around, almost kind of like a Brian McCann type figure, you know, that catcher who can hit, you know, I think he batted 275, 273, something like that mm-hmm. last year. So he can keep the consistent bat in the middle of the lineup for them. Um, but for this year, um, he's batting, the guys around him are Rowdy Tellez and um, I want to say Jesse Winker are the two guys batting on either side of them. And um, yeah, Milwaukee, you're, you're a bad team. And so to give up a guy with a high ceiling for a catcher, um, you know, an offensive minor catcher doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I see what you're going for, but I feel like you could have done this a different way. So if I'm picking a loser anywhere, I'm picking the Brewers, but I get what they feel like they had to do. All right. Um, let's move on. Where would you like to go? I want to go to uh, this one. No, I want to go there last. You want to do that last. Yeah. All right. So Carlos, uh, Rodon, Rodon, yes, Carlos Rodon signed uh, a six year, $162 million contract with the New York Yankees. Um, let's go, Yankees. So, I have mixed feelings about this. Oh, so do I. Please, you go first. I will say this I understand why they went for someone like why they, why they went for pitching help. Um, Garrett Cole is seems to be getting worse every year with the Yankees. So you can't be too confident in that. Uh, Luis Severino, I hope I'm saying that right. Sever- Sever- Severino. Severino, sorry. Sevi to the boys back home. Uh, has, is coming, is still, he's, he, he looked good last year, but you know, he's still recovering from his injury. Um, 
and uh, Nestor looks good. Looks good, but I mean, um, we don't know we, how long term that is. That right. could have easily just been a Cinderella moment for mm-hmm. that guy. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping it's not. I'm hoping it's it, it's long term because it's always it's always good. So I understand why they went and got Carlos. My issue is he's only had two semi fully healthy years and six years for a guy who has who's 30 years old who hasn't really been able to stay healthy is a lot and there's uh to my understanding there's no opt-out there's no there's nothing no it's it's six it's just a true six and i I, I believe he has a no trade clause um yeah he's he's around it's it's weird it's a weird contract for a guy who has uh, an injury history um a recent, relatively recent injury history too. We're not talking about like he's he's. So he, it was tw- just to clarify, it was twelve games in 2017. It was seven games in 2019. So he's missed. More, if you don't count the shortened season, although he only played four out of a possible ten starts in that season. So if you include that, that's even worse because it's literally three of the last six seasons. So you want to talk about what he can do over six years? In three of them, he missed more than half his starts. So I'm with you on that. One. I will say these past two years have been. Good years, yeah, so that looks good in right. their sense. I, 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 six years just seems long for. Uh, he, he is is could he be worth this? Is it could this be a steal? Yes, this could end up being a steal for the Yankees. So let's let's discuss the six because I'm with you. Six is the magic number here because I, I I said all along on you know anywhere else I've been I love Rodon. We got to watch the years though. I think six might be excessive. I was in on five, but you'll 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 see the difference here. Um, I'm still convinced the Houston Astros are easily the team to beat the next three years, arguably even unbeatable the next three years, because that core is basically staying intact. So any contract less than three years or less than, I should say, one or two years didn't make a a whole, whole lot of sense because you may be taking them on just to be the last team Houston beats in the (laughs) AL, right? What good does that do? Now, so three years could have been interesting, but here's where it gets tricky. That 2025 offseason – that's where Glaber Torres officially becomes an unrestricted free agent. Josh Donaldson's money finally goes off the books. Um, Anthony Rizzo presumably retires. That's when his contract comes off. And here's the big one for these purposes. Garrett Cole has a player option out in 2024. But if he does that, the Yankees then have a one-year offer they can make him that he basically has to accept, which basically what this all amounts to is he'll take the player option so he can get the free agency in 2025 at least – to get his money right, given the inflation of the time. Mm-hmm. So presumably you wanted to have this guy for more than three years, because that way, even if you lose Cole in 2025, you have an ace-like pitcher already there when the Astro dynasty finally ends. Because with all the, the good young prospects the Yankees have, they are already, I know this sounds crazy, you can't get this anywhere in Vegas, but they are the heavy 2026 World Series favorite assuming that they have all these pieces still there in 2026, which now they have an ace for the first three post Astro years. So I would have given him four or five. um, But like you mentioned before, the world we're living in right now with these contracts is basically you look at what's the right number and then you just punt a year or punt two years. I mean, they did it with Aaron judge, right? We all wanted seven. They were like, well, you know what, if it's going to four, if, if nine's going to be, what gets you to take our seven sure have nine. So I really think that might've been the same case here. They wanted to give him five. He wanted six. They said, if, if it gets you, you know, sure. Oh let's yeah. Do it. But you needed to go more than three because you didn't want to have live in a world where it's 2026 and you don't have Cole or Rodon. That's the idea. I here. just feel like it could have been four years with a team fifth and a player sixth. I, I would have been okay with, I, I'm always okay with options, but again, some guys aren't, you know, if that's what was going to lose him, yeah. you got to do what you got to do. I get it. I'm, I get I'm, why they I don't did like it. the six either, but there is logic. I, I, I do, do get it. Um, I, I do get it. They had that, you know, um, they don't, they don't want to, they, they, there's also the hope in their mind that this is enough to help them. Oh yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. They're now easily the second best team in the AL. It's not terribly close and you can just lock in Astros Yankees in the ALCS for the next several, you know, probably next three years, maybe inevitably one of them will get cold in the playoffs somewhere along the way. But if you told me right now, can I take a bet that two of the next three years, Astros Yankees in the ALCS. Yeah, that's easiest bet. I'm, you know, most confident bet I'm ever going to take in my life. 
Um, so, I mean, they're right there. And then Rodon has traditionally pitched well against the Astros. He's traditionally had a very bulldog-like mentality when he does get to pitch in big games. This is a no-brainer. If you're a Yankee fan who takes the low-hanging fruit of best pitcher who was on the board, we got him, the Evil Empire's back. It's it's low-hanging fruit for a reason, but you're not wrong. This was the next domino the Yankees needed to go and, and knock over, and they did. I mean, bravo to Cashman and for for hitting the no-brainer out of the park here. But sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes GMs don't do that. And this was a case of, come on, this makes sense for everybody. Let's do it. They got the job done with money not really being an issue, which is kind of what you always like to see from the Yankees, at least what you, you, know, what you expect from the Yankees. All right. And on to our last topic. I, I need to explain this one. Guys, I got to pick, I got to pick the five this week. That's all I'm going to say. So... Well, you know, we're going to start with the a money amount. It turns, it comes to be twenty one million per year for a thirty three year old. What, what is he even? What position is he? I don't he's even start, see a position he's a starting here. Pitcher. Oh, base he's a starting pitcher, pitcher. Starting pitcher. Oh, I'm sorry, Gilroy. I really. Anyway, it's it's Chris Bassett, guys. Chris Bassett signed twenty one mil a year, three years, sixty three mil uh, with the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, former Met, in case you're wondering. Um, but yeah, do you can I can I take the floor on this one because I I feel like you're this, very confused as to why we're even discussing. Well, I'm just gonna say this. This <laughs> seems like ahead. a very Toronto move. It is a very Toronto move. Very nice. Yes, that's kind of where I'm going with this. Oh, okay, man, nailed it. Um, it's a it's a Toronto move, but it it leads to what we were just talking about. So, guys, just real quick, um, check us out every week. We're gonna be covering about five or six free agents trades each week. Um, and so we're we're obviously going to have to spread out some of the bigger ones or the more important ones, or we're going to end up with some really god awful episodes near the end of January. So we'll mix in some that are a little bit sneakier, a little bit more interesting to one of us. And this one stood out to me because it's so Blue Jays, and you could make the argument that this is the biggest move other than Degrom, who seemingly is trying to get away from competition by going to Texas. This is the biggest move by any non-Houston, non-New York AL team this off season. And it just goes to prove the point we were just saying, which is it almost looks like the other 13 teams in the AL are aware that this is a two horse race. Nobody is doing any Houston went out and got Jose Abreu. We'll talk about that in the next couple of weeks. The Yankees went out, obviously they re-signed judge. They, you know, they got Rodon, they're doing things, but what else? I mean, Boston made a questionable signing, um, with their new leadoff hitter, who people don't know how good he's going to be. Um, otherwise, they signed Justin Turner. Woohoo! Um, you know, uh, Tampa Bay signed Zach Eflin. Okay, Zach Efron uh, might as well be at this point. Um, you know, the, um, all the but all the power young shortstops went to the NL. Um, you know, Verlander moved over to the other side. The NL is so much more stacked than the AL right now, and I think part of that is the world is finally starting to catch up on this idea that Houston is just light years ahead of everybody. The Yankees are always going to buy their way into the tops. And maybe it's time for some of these teams to start retooling because Toronto doesn't know how to say no. We know that. That's, you just said that perfectly. And so they're going to keep going. And they also went on Kevin Kermeyer, of all people, um, to help out their defense. Um, and because they're invested in guys like George Springer, they really don't have a choice. They have to keep this, you know, era going. Um, but it, it looks like, Actually, you know, I, I'm, I'm, most teams are going to be very content to just finish 20 games behind Houston this year. Yeah, I mean, um, watch out for the Orioles. They're gonna, they're probably gonna accidentally get in into the playoffs because no one wants Cause, cause to win because some, somebody <laughs> has to, you know. And again, obviously, I'm being a little facetious here. We know that the Rays always put together a, a proud season. You know, the, the, Rays the, the Guardians gonna, did go with Josh Bell, but it's, yeah, the talent is clearly on the National League side of things this year. Though the, I do have to say that the Rays do typically just surprise. Right. And, They're and, always just a surprise. I don't know how this team constantly just churns out this talent. Right. And, and I even kind of like that Zach Eflin trade. What will probably come up in one of these weeks, in, or sorry, not trade, signing. It will probably come up somewhere in January. But the, the point is, I mean, we, we know the Angels are broken and they have done nothing to particularly get better. Um, you know, the, the A's are still – you know, in a rebuild, the Orioles are, are making their way sort of out of a rebuild, but they're still there. Boston, you know, some of their signings were bonkers. We'll talk about them all at later episodes. That just seems to um, be them lately, though. You know, they're, they're just right. they they just seem to be constantly not sure what they're doing. 
The yeah. Tigers are still developing. The Twins lost Carlos Correa and signed Joey Gallo. Do with that, do with that math what you will. Uh, you know, it's just it's a it's a very down AL. And this this move, um, you know, really was more a vehicle for for us to bring that to your attention. Um, that you're going to see some very, very seemingly bonkers or small moves in the AL that are going to carry more weight than they normally do because the path that remember you only have to get to seven nowadays in the AL. Um, and so, you know, the, the path there, sorry, six, um, you know, the path there to, to make the playoffs is, um, is, is not that, is not that treacherous. Um, and so we'll, we'll see some interesting signings along the way. I'm sure that, you know, we'll, we'll turn out to carry surprising weight. All right. Thank you all so much for watching. Remember to like, share, subscribe, comment down below. Who do you want us to cover? There are a ton of free agents still out there. We want to hear from you. Who should we go to next? Also, who do you think, or who did we miss? Who did Mongo miss? Who did Mongo miss for short, uh, for uh, shortstop? Nope, base runners. Yeah, let me hear. Who are the best stolen base guys today? That's I'm clearly missing somebody because my list is nobody. So question of the day, who's the best stolen base guy right now in baseball? Second question of the day. Who do you want us to cover next week? We're gonna, I mean, we still have a few more weeks before we even get to pitchers and catchers. We'll try and cover everybody, but if you want us to move somebody to the start of the list, you go right ahead and tell us to do that. We're here for you guys. Again, thank you all for watching. Love y'all. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Solstice, whatever you celebrate. Enjoy it. We love you all, guys. We'll see you in the new year. Peace. Enjoy your winter holidays.